your viewers, well, I'm very excited because today I get to speak to a personal hero. I, I have with me Paul Grundy, who is founder of the website jwfacts.com, which was instrumental in my awakening from the Jehovah's Witness religion. I'm sure the same can be said for many of you watching. Paul, thanks so much for joining me. Hi, Lloyd. Thanks for having me. So we've got so much to get through and uh, I need to try to hold myself back a little bit from gushing <laughs> about all the ways in which my life is different, thanks in large part to your work. We can kind of come to that a bit later, but I guess to begin with, we can start by asking you to explain your story uh, and your background with the witnesses. Yeah, so um, I, I was brought up a witness and... I've got, I've got quite a lot of stories, I guess, on the, on the website, so I don't want to sort of go over all of it again too much, I guess. But, yeah, I was, uh, when I finished school, I went to university, which was not really allowed at the time. So I started full-time service as well to justify being able to go to university and ended up doing seven, seven years as a regular pioneer, or three and a half years regular pioneer and then three and a half years in Bethel. So I got to really see the inner workings of the religion. And then after my, my parents then went on and dad became a circuit overseas for, for 20 years. Uh, so through him, I got to meet a lot of the uh, different circuit overseas and, and I met a lot of the Bethelites and including a number of the uh, Bethelites. I saw um, Fred Franz, I actually waited for him, a few of the other governing body. Um, I was a good friend of Jeffrey Jackson. So I sort of, I, I guess I, I got to to really know the inner, inner workings of the religion um, and got to know a lot about the do doctrine and so when I when I did leave, I, I felt I had a bit of an obligation that I had access to so much information and so many stories and so much of you know, how things are done in the religion that I, I felt I sort of needed to um, share that with other people because I, I don't think um, the majority of witnesses get to sort of have that, that full rounded understanding of how the religion really operates. Well, indeed, and you were perfectly positioned to compile all this information. I'm. I just have to ask you about your father. Am I right in saying that your your father has since passed away? Um, but he, you mentioned, yes, yeah. But you mentioned that he was he allowed you to go to university despite being a circuit overseer. Did did he not have any get into any trouble for that? Uh, well, at the time he wasn't a circuit overseer. He was uh, presiding overseer in the congregation. We actually had quite a bit of trouble. I had um, people talking to the, the circuit overseer in the uh, in that area at the time, um, but because I was pioneering, he said, "Well, you know, if your kids aren't pioneering, you know, wait till they pioneer before you complain about it." Um, people spoke to Dad about it as well, but I think because I was doing a lot within the uh, within the truth as such, I was getting up there, you know, giving lots of talks and experiences, etc. It sort of sort of balanced out the fact that I was also. I'm going to university. Although when I got to Bethel, uh, they sort of punished me for it because I got into Bethel. I had the, uh, the capability to sort of maybe help in the uh, some of the bookkeeping, uh, but instead to make sure that I was uh, kept humble, I spent a year uh, cleaning toilets and uh, factory cleaning. So they made sure that I realised that I wasn't better than anyone else because of my uh, education. <laughs> and you feel that they they kind of just to spite you for going to. Going through higher education, they made you clean toilets for longer than you perhaps would have done. Uh, in fact, I, I don't know when I would have stopped cleaning toilets. I mean, I don't really know the, the motivation. I actually got kicked off the toilet cleaning because I was uh, I used to go down and play music at the at the pool when I was cleaning the pool. So then they thought that they couldn't really trust me uh, wandering around on my own doing such a terrible job. So then they brought me into waitering so that they could make sure that I wasn't enjoying uh, myself too much. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So... You mentioned being in Bethel for about three years. Um, was mm -hmm. it in? Am I right in saying that it was while you were in Bethel that you know you started to kind of see see problems with the organisation? Yeah, I mean, looking back, I I guess I always had some problems with faith. Like I I, I read through some of the notes I've taken and diaries and. And poetry I wrote back when I was a teenager and I always struggled with some of the concepts of me being lucky enough to be born into the only true religion. Uh, I was just lucky enough to be born into the one that was going to get saved when everyone else was going to die. So I always had those doubts, but it was going to Bethel that it really became apparent that there is just no guidance by Holy Spirit. It was just a factory 
was run by men with their personality flaws and it was really no different than some of the bosses I'd worked for in, in other companies. In fact, I, I had jobs with uh, normal companies, normal, normal, normal people, and the way they treated me was so much better than the way I got treated at Bethel. I had, um, I had, had a number of terrible experiences at Bethel. Uh, there were, and, and really unreasonable things like I was uh, cleaning the um, was one of the head cleaners for the convention and so I asked if I started work a bit earlier if I could uh, stop work a couple of hours early so I could go do the convention cleaning and organize the team and they just said no you can't do that these are the Bethel hours you have to do the Bethel hours and I'm like I used to ask my worldly boss to have a, a couple of hours off to go to conventions or the Saturday off that I clean at night instead and they were always compliant and here these are this uh, religion where I was trying to do more for the religion, they wouldn't wouldn't let me do it. So I just saw that it was just run by men. Um, and then eventually there was a, the, 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 cat, the main catalyst was where one of my friends was committing adultery and during that time got promoted to being an elder. And I'm like, wow, where's, where's the Holy Spirit? Like the Holy Spirit knows he's committed adultery and it still appoints him as an elder. And that's where it's really triggered this thought that, you know, the Holy Spirit just isn't running this, uh, isn't running this organization. So did you know he was committing adultery and you were kind of keeping quiet about it? Oh, no, I didn't know at the time. Um, yeah. He'd been committing adultery with his wife's best friend for seven years and then after he got um, made an elder, the, the other lady ended up getting uh, feeling guilty and she went to the elders and that's when it came out. It had been going on for 11 years and he actually brought this woman into, the, uh, into Bethel um, while everyone went to a meeting on Tuesday night, he pretended to be sick and went and got her and brought her into Bethel. So it was like very, very brazen. Um, and when it all came out, it was a very big deal. But I'm thinking, wow, if, where, where, where's the Holy Spirit in all of this? And, and when I asked, actually asked the Bethel elders about that and asked my father, and they're like, well, Holy Spirit guides us through providing the Bible and the principles. And I went, no, no, that's not what the Watchtower says. The Watchtower says Holy Spirit actively guides the decisions and the appointments and the articles. So you can't like weasel around and say it's just that we read the Bible. Um, the, the way I've been taught is that it's actually actively involved. Um, so that's that's really what triggered my you know, desire to sort of look more into the doctrine, more into other religions, more into what other people believe. So did you go kind of straight from um, Bethel to you know, activist, or was there kind of like a transitional period where you were kind of trying to figure things out or and maybe salvage something of your faith? Yeah, I, I my, my parents uh, wanted to take me overseas. We went to South America because they, they like traveling. And so while I was still a Bethlehem, I had like two months of a holiday of holidays accrued. So I went and I traveled and I stayed in Bethels all around South America. And then I was supposed to stay in New York, Bethel, but my official um, holidays had run out, so my termination of Bethel had run out, so then they didn't allow me to stay there. Uh, after that, I then decided to continue traveling for another over a year. Um, and during that period, I, I sort of just met people of different cultures and just wanted to learn about people and life. And I, I sort of came to realize I didn't really believe in, you know, that God was directing the organization, but I just had this, this, I didn't know what to believe, so this huge emptiness. And then I thought if I come back, I'm not going to know anybody. I don't have any friends. I'm going to lose my family if I leave. I better give it another shot. So I, I, I went through this period of trying to fade out, got uh, cold feet, I guess, got just didn't have the, um, I guess, the strength to, to do what I really should have done back then. And so then came back into the trying to just like uh, go through the go through the motions within the religion. But it was actually when when I came back and I confessed that I'd done a few things overseas. I'm sitting before the the elders. And I'm going, I actually know that I don't believe this is the truth. If they don't disfellowship me, I'm not at all repentant. I don't think I did anything wrong. I think I did what I needed to do. If they think I'm repentant, then that's further proof that the uh, Holy Spirit isn't directing any of this. So that was, was my actual um, coming back and repenting where I realized that, um, yeah, this is just a group of men that don't really know what they're doing. Um, but, I, you know, I, 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 I still just didn't know what to believe. So I, I hadn't done the research. I didn't understand other doctrine enough to make a, an informed decision of what to do. So I just then ticked along for a few years just to try and keep the family happy. And they they just presumably <coughs> reproved you rather than disfellowshipping you? Yes, yeah, so I got public reproof. It's, uh, so they got up on the platform and said that I'd, uh, 
had done things that I shouldn't have done and I was repentant and then everyone came up and they were crying and it was like a, a huge thing and I was just like, wow, it's um, I'm, I'm stuck here. I don't really believe it, but I just don't have anything else to do or anywhere else to go. So I sort of feel ashamed of it now. When I look back and see all these young people that, you know, even people I grew up with that made the, the escape in their late teens or the early 20s and here I was, I just didn't have the, you know, that strength to do that and I ended up, you know, floundering around for another 10 years before I finally had the strength to do what, what I knew was right all along. So take us through the genesis of jwfacts.com because arguably, you know, my activism is due at least in part to that. I mean, when I was first looking for information, when I'd kind of given myself permission to look behind the curtain, First of all, it was Wikipedia, because I figured, well, that's like a neutral place where they're not going to be necessarily making judgments or saying anything negative. But after after Wikipedia had given me a few things to question, your website was, was the first thing that I looked at, I think even before Crisis of Conscience. So, and, and just the kind of calm, rational tone of the website. And one thing I mentioned in my book as well is that one of the first things that I did on go on visiting your website was trying to find out who'd, who'd made it, who'd written it. And there was a photograph of, of you and Zach on one of the pages that for some reason just made me think, yeah, he, he looks like a normal guy. He looks like someone, like not my idea of like an angry, you know, bitter, resentful apostate. So it really was something. And I'm, I'm curious to know what the genesis of that website was. Yeah, I mean, the the funny thing is that the reason it's become uh, what it is is because of uh, some of the elders and because of my mother. So originally the elders came and they were talking to me and I admitted I didn't really have faith in the organisation. So they came up with the, the normal answer, you know, the past prayer association service study. So do more of that, you know, do more study, prove this is the, the truth. So... I, I decided to, to start doing more studies, so I started researching, so I went through the uh, reasoning book and I just went through each topic and I thought I'll do research though, but I need to get a balanced opinion. I can't just keep studying what the Watchtower says if I want to be honest with myself. I need to see what other opinions say. And the very first one I started with abortion and it's like, this is very black and white. It's, uh, it's wrong under any circumstance. And then I was reading stuff about, you know, situations where maybe abortion isn't wrong, whether, you know, maybe the mother's life's at stake or, you know, maybe she's been raped and all these things. And I'm like, wow, there's all this, like, grey area in, in topics that I just always assume was black and white. And it was well, virtually every single topic that kept coming up that, um, that there's all these things I'd never, ever considered. And I had to start writing it down because it was just spinning around and around in my head. I was like, is it this or is it that? You know, what does this mean? Am I right about this? And so I had to sort of really put it down in, into paper. Um, and then I started discussing these topics with my mother. And she really is like the most fundamentalist uh, Jehovah's Witness and would just throw back all the, all the answers that every uh, really good trained Jehovah's Witness will say. So all the, the light gets brighter or wait on Jehovah or you know, different viewpoints. And so that just prompted me to keep going back and doing more and more and more research and thorough research. And so she sort of helped me get to understand not only my full understanding of how the, the religion is conceived, but how my father and how my mother sort of believed things, what angles they came at. So I, I ended up with a huge amount of information from multiple viewpoints and answering every single question after you know, many, many months of arguing back and forth about it. So I had this incredible big resource. And then during that, um, like yourself, I, I, I couldn't start by researching apostate things because that was you know, going to be lies. It was going to be influenced by Satan. So I started with encyclopedias. It all started with the Watchtower publications, the older ones, then the encyclopedias, and then finally got onto the apostate information, and then I saw crisis of conscience, and I'm like, wow, there's so much information here that's already been done. I've spent, you know, it was years really in the making of, uh, of research that it was all, a lot of it was just clearly already there. I'm like, why didn't I read this before? <laughs> so I did want, um, at some point I eventually went, like I, I could have saved myself really 10 years of, of heartache if I had just been given that book 10 years earlier. So I, I thought I need to get this information out there on, on the internet um, so that somebody can come along and just go in one go, just find all that information that had taken me years to, to pile up. Um, 
I mean, at first, I, I that wasn't my first goal. My first goal, I, I created just a little anonymous website for my parents to read because I couldn't, you know, we were arguing. It just was going nowhere. So I thought if they can just read the information in a nice, calmly laid out way, maybe that would have an effect, um, which it didn't. <laughs> but uh, that, that was where it sort of started. And eventually I went, actually, I want all this information out there for other people to benefit from so they can you know, save themselves years of, of work and confusion. So... So the very first kind of proto-site, JW Facts, was just for your parents. Is that right? Yeah, so I just had a few pages there, and it wasn't... Um, I actually printed it as a book, first of all, but I uh, gave it to a couple of my friends, my cousin, um, to read. And then after that, I was like, if I, if I do print it as a book, I don't know how many people will read it. And I spoke to Ray Franz, actually, about whether it was worth printing the information. And he sort of told me how limited, even with his book, how, how limited um, edition or how many copies he was getting out, particularly in the other languages. It wasn't a way to really make money or get it into that many hands. And I thought, well, I'm really not interested in making money. I just want to get as many people to read as possible. Um, and so that's where eventually I, I put everything there. And, and then after, after getting this fellowship, I had nothing to lose. So I put my name on it and I could sort of put more information out there. I'm, I'm really glad that you were able to talk to Ray because uh, when by the time that I was kind of waking up, in fact, I think we must have overlapped slightly. He died in 2011, I think, or, or, 20, or 2010, <laughs> thereabouts. That's kind of when I was waking up. And by the time I knew about him, he'd already died. So um, it's good that he was able to kind of give you some advice. And I would agree with him that, yeah, he's... yeah go on. Yeah, he, he, was, uh, he would answer with these huge emails, like very, very long. I think he must take, like you talk about some experiences or something that had recently come along. So he probably sent a bulk of it to each person during that week. But then everything was very carefully tailored. And I, mean, I, I wrote a specific letter when Jeff Jackson became of the governing body because I'm going, I know, I knew this guy and he seemed to be a, like an intelligent, reasonable guy. What's the chance that he could become the next Ray Franz and, and leave and yeah, what is the motive? How, how do governing body members know they're not in a cult when they they know the history and the inner workings? And so he gave some interesting insight into the types of governing body members um, and, you know, why are they on there and whether they really believe or not. It makes me feel happy to think that you guys were kind of in touch and, and he was able to get pass on some of his advice and some of his ideas because I think the the end product, it certainly helped me and I'm sure it's continuing to help many. He's right in, he was right in saying that you reach fewer people with print. I, I've kind of learned that myself with my book. And with, with my book, I think there's over 2,000 copies sold so far. But that's still a small amount compared to how many people you can reach just by making information available on the Internet, which is why I'm so keen on, you know, primarily focusing on my YouTube channel, because then you can just reach as many, you know, you can reach potentially tens of thousands of people with you know with a, a decent decent video so <laughs> i've got a few more questions to ask um in what ways do you think the religion has changed since you left ah so it's a good question because i went to my first meeting today after i i, I haven't been to a, a proper meeting for probably 12 years now and um i had heard that it had changed dramatically uh, so I thought, oh, I really need to get in there since I write about this stuff. I better get in there and see what a meeting's you, really you like. You sent me a photograph uh, just... of your of your feet at the Kingdom Hall, didn't you? It looked, I was like, you're in a Kingdom Hall, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> those chairs, I actually made those, well, not maybe that specific chair, but I made chairs for Kingdom Halls out of that same frame, the frame welded up frame and exactly how they do those. I'm like, wow, this is deja vu because that was 25 years ago. But um. Yeah, what, ma had, what made you want to go back? Just... What made you want to go back to a kingdom hall? I mean, I wanted to see what has changed because it sort of seemed to me that the religion is just dramatically different. And um, but also, I've got this little son, and I did a little video for my YouTube channel that I'll release shortly uh, with my son, and he's like, he's he just couldn't pronounce all these terms. Like uh, there was apostasy, and he's like pot 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 state, and getting really confused. And I'm like, oh wow, like I didn't realize these aren't terms that normal people use it's it, there's this whole education he's missed out on by not going to the to the meetings 
And so I've been threatening him for years that I'm going to punish you by having to sit there for an hour and a half through a meeting and, and like see what I had to suffer for three times a week for years. Um, so I was actually going to tell that if anyone asked me what I was doing there, I was just going to say, well, I was brought up in this and I wanted my son to suffer the same. But everyone was so nice. I couldn't, uh, I ended up being, you know, having very, very nice conversations with many, many people there. Um, so yeah, so we sat down, it was, everyone's got their little iPads out, which is great because I could just send texts and surf the internet the whole time. But I mean, it hadn't really changed fundamentally. You've just got the, the brother standing on the platform with the same old core information of pray to God and he'll look after you and he looks after all of us. And uh, the watchtower is about um, doing everything possible to get into the new system and why would we do you know, committing morality, short-term gains for getting into the new system. Like that core message of just manipulation and fear and that was the same. And it was quite embarrassing because I'm sitting there and they just kept talking about sexual immorality over and over and over again. <laughs> i got like a nine-year-old son there just, he's yeah. going, oh, my God, they, they said like, yeah, you go, sexual immorality, they couldn't stop saying that term. <laughs> so yeah. the, uh, it's, yeah. it's quite inappropriate material, isn't it, to be bombarding a child with week in, week out, just constant talk about porn and masturbation and yeah. fornication and what have you. Astonishing. Yeah, and it's stuff that he doesn't really, it's just a different language almost than this mm. concept about, you know, setting the guidelines with your partner beforehand. And, oh, it was just, um, yeah, it's, a, it's just like going into a different world, a bit of a time warp. Um, so the only real difference I saw was like everyone's got their iPads and then you've got the two TV screens are playing the songs uh, they changed um, the songs on the screens, and then during the watchtower, they're sh uh, showing images of the from the watchtower um, up on the screens. So that, that was, you know, try, trying to trying to become a little bit more exciting. But I, I it wasn't as charismatic as I thought. I, I was hoping that they were a little bit more like the evangelical churches because I've seen a few videos where they get up and dance. But these were really old old people, so it was still. Just morbid singing, you know, to uh, to songs on the video instead of in the book. Although I, I did speak to one of the pe people afterwards, and I said, "Oh, you know, this is, um, you know, it sort of changed a bit." And he goes, "Oh, wow, you you would not believe how much things have changed in the last year." He goes, "We've got this great website. We now have this like JWTV, and some of the old people come and sit there at the Kingdom Hall and watch it because they don't have the internet at home." And uh, and I, I was like, "Oh, how does it make you feel like seeing?" the governing body, you know, talking, and he goes, oh, it's, it's, it's fantastic that we can now interact directly with uh, with God's chosen channel. So I, I thought it was like every time I watch Tight Pants Tony or um, Let or anyone, I'm like completely embarrassed to think I believe I actually you know, believed or was associated with that type of person. But, you know, for some reason, the, the true believers still seem to think that, that's, that, that they are God's, God's people. And I'm like, they're just an, an embarrassment. You wouldn't. You wouldn't have them running a, a corporation, let alone a eight billion strong religion, if you know you would think. I, I think that's probably because I think it has changed in a few, in, in a number of ways. There's the, there's the website, there's the videos, um, there's like you say the technology, the tablets, there's um, the cart witnessing. I think the most significant change has been how the, the the amount of visibility that the governing body get, like you just like you've just said. Because when I was a JW, right up to when I was kind of waking up around 2010, 2011, it didn't feel like you really knew who the governing body were, unless you were like an insider or maybe you lived in New York and you, you saw them regularly. I didn't really know the names of the governing body until I started waking up. And the, my very first few videos I did for my channel, I did a series called Getting to Know You because I was literally hunting down audio clips of talks and putting them with captions so that people could see what the governing body was saying. But then, of course, um, in 2014, JW Broadcasting gets launched and suddenly in full HD <laughs> on, a, on an almost monthly basis or at least two monthly basis, we're now getting the governing body being beamed into people's living rooms. And I think that's fantastic because mm. people get to see for themselves that these are just... Uh, eccentric, uh, bumbling, um, small-minded men. Mm. Yeah, I mean, my, my first um, time interacting was at Bethel with a governing body member, and it was uh, 
uh, Ray, Fra not, uh, Ray Fred Franz. Uh, he was in his late 90s at the time, and they, they got me as the head waiter to seat him, and they said to sit a, to get a, a nice blonde, uh, young blonde sister to sit next to him because he's got this real thing for blondes. And so there was a girl, I think her name was Cheryl, she was one of the nurses, and I sat her with her, and I was, like, shocked. Like, here I had this, I'd always had this perception Are you, are you of, making of that up? Oh, that just sounds outrageous. I want to sit next to a blonde sister. That's true. Yeah, it's true. There are, uh, and they, and I like. I sort of suddenly realised that all, all these people, these these um, different uh, governing body members, and the the Bethel, uh, the uh, branch committee members, etc. They all had their their ways, their personalities. Some of them were really grumpy. Some were mean. Some were nice. But they all were just other, just like anyone else. Um, well, and you'd, so you'd that's be embarrassed, where, wouldn't yes. you? You'd be embarrassed even making that public knowledge that you like sitting next to blonde women let alone you know when you go on overseas visits making sure that that's one of the criteria that gets reached that's just astonishing <laughs> yeah and, yeah and it, it sort of takes away that the the um that whole um i can't think of the word but it just makes it like a, just a religion. It's just uh, human beings, and I, and I guess um, in reality, you know, every religion is going to be run by human beings. And Moses was a human. But when you when you're not in part of Bethel, you sort of build up this uh, this special feeling about them. Um, I'm watching the the Young Pope. Uh, it's a TV show at the moment, and it's absolutely incredible. And it's the same sort of thing here. You have this Pope that is infallible, has ultimate say. No one can question him. But he's just a human with his with his own uh, thoughts, and yet there's a billion people following mindlessly following this person. And some of the popes have been horrific in the past. You know, some of them, like the latest ones, are a little bit better. And the, and the governing body is the same. And once you get into Bethel, or once you start seeing them on you know JWTV, you start realizing that you know, the, these are people that are just normal people with their personality flaws. But they also are making mistakes. They're not directed by Holy Spirit. So why is it that so many millions of people are just laying their lives down for them um, and willing to, to like with my son, he was horrified when I said that they don't take blood transfusions and he could not believe that, that a person would let their child die um, refusing blood simply because some religious leader has said that that's what they think the Bible says. And he's going, and like with blood, my son's going, but does it say that in the Bible? I'm like, well, it doesn't say don't take blood for infusions. It uh, says you're not allowed to eat blood. Um, and it's not about, um, it's about saying respect for life. So really, it, it doesn't really carry over to blood transfusions at all but yeah that's what they interpret it as and so people let their children die for that and my son just could not comprehend it and I can't comprehend it anymore either particularly after knowing these people meeting them seeing them online yeah we're talking about leaders who are detached from reality and entirely unworthy of the veneration that gets lavished on them um I've got another question a few more questions to rattle through um do you sense that more people are leaving or does it feel the same as when you left? It's not a huge amount more. It's a little bit more, but not a huge amount more. I mean, it's quite shocking because I, I really started this, I guess, 10 years ago. And, and when I got this information, and I'm like, wow, this is now you know, really freely available on the internet. Um, it was this feeling that the religion will just start nosediving after, I, I personally thought 2014, because I, I knew witnesses are very superstitious, and so I thought there's going to be this idea, you know, you've got the, you know, the, uh, the generation teaching sort of got um, messed up a bit, but there's still this idea of 100 years from 1914, we'll just hang around till then, and then I just thought the religion would nosedive, and uh, I'm shocked that it hasn't. It's, there's this, like, gradual movement that sort of, Maybe increasing slightly, but it's not it's not a dam breaking or anything. And and I think um, I've been thinking a lot about you know why is this and uh, and I also read an interesting article um, recently about what how the internet's have broken and fake news on the internet etc. And so the problem is you have first of all cognitive dissonance. People don't want to leave. They don't want to change their beliefs. They don't want to face the truth. They don't want to face reality. They just want what's comfortable. So the majority of people are just these true followers that will take whatever is their cultural norms that they've been given. And so you've got the apostates giving information, which it's, you know, it's we've put together um, as a group a lot of very, very compelling and interesting information. But then like with fake news on Facebook, you have uh, JW.org, 
uh, putting out this very compelling information and there's so much misinformation on it there's I've got an article actually on it so many things it's like you know why don't we do this or do we do that do we shun no we don't shun and and, and things that are just blatantly lies and so you have that misinformation so you've got all these people too scared to you know wake up to reality and then the fact that then they can easily find an answer that's really simple and just like appeases them that it's not going to be as dramatic Although I still have a little bit of hope that there's this bigger movement that is the, the physically in, mentally out people, that there's more and more of them. And as they become more aware of each other and they are aware that there's this support for them, then there could be the, the, it could start to increase at a more rapid rate of people actually leaving. But they just need to know that there's other people there ready to help them um, in the same situation. It, it feels to me, I mean, I keep expecting kind of the floodgates to open and to be kind of completely overwhelmed by the amount of people exiting, and that's not happened. But I, it feels to me as though there is a gradual increase, a very gradual mm -hmm. increase, and that kind of makes sense because all it takes usually in a family is for one person to wake up, and then the likelihood of the rest of the family starting to wake up just slightly increases. So you can expect a slight <laughs> snowball effect. But I agree with you that the the propaganda that's being put out by Watchtower is very clever in terms of playing on people's emotions and bypassing logic entirely and just making them feel good about being Jehovah's Witnesses. So, um, and, and, and this thing where faith is a virtue, the the unquestioning um, acceptance of faith is supposed to be this wonderful thing when it's actually a really terrible thing because it means anyone can be a victim to anything. You, the the uh, and the fact that you know, strong religious belief uh, isn't to do with logic. It's um, it's a very powerful uh, that, that people can just be moved by emotion, and the witnesses uh, do that just so well with the whole, you know, the 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 control they have over information, the control over your behaviour, and then the control if you leave with shunning. They've it's they've packaged up that emotional side so strongly that it's, uh, it takes a while, a lot to get that logic through. Absolutely. Now I've got another question for you. Um, the ex-Jehovah's Witness community is now large and there are many diverse voices which can often lead to infighting and controversy. Do you ever worry about newly exiting witnesses being put off by acrimony between ex-JWs or, or are you optimistic that they can deal with it? Uh, no, I think it's terrible. <laughs> I, I, I... I can imagine that that's exactly what a witness wants to see. They want to get on there and go, look at these people, their lives have fallen apart, they've got nothing else to think about, they've got nothing else of interest, and then they just fight amongst themselves. So I'm, I'm really uh, disappointed about it. Um, you know, the whole point of leaving is realising that there is not one specific truth that humans can understand. It's like we're going to have different opinions and different people have different lives that are applicable to them. So whether somebody likes is introverted or extroverted, that will all come up with something different. So just because someone has a different point of view, you know, shouldn't cloud the that whole overall viewpoint that the Watchtower is a damaging religion um, that people it either needs to change or more so people need to, to, to leave it. And that should be the end goal, like pointing in on each other instead of what that end goal is, I think is, is terribly destructive and, and quite... Um, you know, depressing for me to see that happen. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I'm kind of, I have two ways of looking at it. One is to say, well, it's almost inevitable that you're going to get more friction the larger a movement gets, because the larger it gets, the more diverse voices you have. And the more diverse voices you have, the more they're going to kind of clash with each other. So in a way, it's encouraging to see, um, in a strange way, it's encouraging to see infighting because that proves that the movement's growing. But I see what you mean. On the other hand, it's extremely off-putting and it feels as though some ex-witnesses just can't grasp the idea that other people are entitled to their opinions. And it doesn't matter whether it's some person on a forum or someone with a massive YouTube channel, we all get to have our opinion and don't deserve to be attacked for having it. So it feels as though perhaps the JW mentality is sticking a little bit, where it's like, no, this is this is the one true way, and if you disagree with me, you're you're this, you're that, Q character assassination. So Yeah, I mean, that, that's a whole ad hominem attack thing where I, I get it all the time, emails to my website attacking me as a person. I, I, on my YouTube thing that I did the other day, someone said, oh, we heard they got this fellowship for being a liar and a thief, and I'm like... <laughs> 
Well, that's a new one because you know, I'd heard every other thing under the, under the sun about why I left, um, but not thief. I hadn't heard that one before. So um, there's just these attacks that, that people do on you. And so, yeah, maybe you're true. That it's just a, it's a fact of life that they'll then just start being the same people but towards each other outside the community. Um, but, yeah, I don't think it's very productive. I, I think it's great that there's different viewpoints. And I may not agree that, you know, some people are more aggressive in their activism. I, I don't particularly agree with that. But I think, well, that, that might work as well. So I don't um, – I just try not to get involved because I know as soon as I start voicing too many opinions, strong opinions, I'll be one a bit like my manipulative mother and the other one is I'll start getting attacked back. So I try and sit back a little bit. <laughs> but I guess I guess your activism is ideally positioned because, you know, I've noticed you've – started um putting out more youtube content and that's fantastic and by the way you guys should check out the jw facts um youtube channel but for the most part your work is well here are the facts and mm. when it's just pure pure facts then there isn't really much to argue with but the minute you start voicing an opinion the minute you make yourself susceptible to oh well i, I see things differently and what have you so yeah it's yeah, i mean i don't I, i'm I'm a little bit uh, unsure about sort of my opinions because I, I realise like I missed out on 35 years of actually proper information. You know, I had these rock solid opinions, and now I realise when I talk about uh, some of these other things, uh, I, I don't sound like an expert, and I, I change along the way, and I hear other people's points of view, and so I don't want to be dogmatic about all these other topics that I'm not really an expert in. So yes, yeah, so I, I like to just stick to the. the the facts about Jehovah's Witnesses, and then, like I said, I'm doing the YouTube because a lot of people are used to that medium now. They don't, they don't want to read. So as much as I was a bit shy about getting my face on the internet, I think uh, I just need to do that to try and you know, reach that new, new audience, the younger sort of audience. Can I be really cheeky and ask what kind of visitor what? numbers you're getting at JW Facts? Yeah, my my visitors haven't gone up for quite a while now. So I get about 50,000 unique visitors a month uh, and have for maybe five years now. And that's where I realise I've got to start getting onto the YouTube because I did like that these YouTube clips get 10,000 in a week uh, or in a couple of weeks. So that's sort of where they're going to. So I realise otherwise it'll, you know, the internet's sort of stagnating and these multimedia forms are, are becoming more important. Although that's still a lot of, of people, isn't it? Fifty thousand. It's, it's nothing to uh, to be embarrassed about. And those are those are fifty thousand people who are they're not just looking for the latest sensation. They are gen they're doing genuine research into into their beliefs, like I was back in sort of twenty ten twenty eleven. It's um, yeah, it's a valuable resource. I think it's over four million unique visits I've had over the last ten years now, and that started from nothing uh, to sort of millions. And then you know, even the latest video clip I put on, I think there were it's already like several thousand hours of people viewing it, and so that that reach that the internet gives, it's uh, it's just incredible how how much of an effect you can have if you uh, if you have content there. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that the internet's been a total game changer, and. I, I don't know how things would have worked <laughs> before the internet when, you know, your your best way of reaching people was essentially just to write a book. And again, as you know, going back to what we were saying earlier, you're you're always going to have limited reach in print media. It's just a fact compared to your reach on the internet. So um, that's kind of why I think that's a large reason why we are seeing this steady increase is because of the availability of information it's, it's absolutely brilliant um what is your most popular jw facts article uh off the top of my head now i think uh there's the one on shunning is one of the most popular ones um and a couple of the controversial ones so shunning the blood transfusions the child abuse ones so oh and the other one actually that's taken over is the one on beards <laughs> beards oh, wow. and christmas so the two that i did at, uh, later on because i didn't think they were like that that important topics were the ones that ended up being more uh, um, interesting to people because I, I mean to me the deep doctrine I, like I, I was reading all the old books you know when I was a kid and in bed and, you know uh, to me doctrine was really important and that was the important thing to prove but for a lot of other people it's just this manipulation and control and it's like you know, there's no reason why men can't have beards. In fact, men are supposed to have beards according to the Bible and there's no reason not to sort of celebrate birthdays. Um, and and so those articles about birthdays and Christmas and beers, they're just the normal average person who just thinks doesn't feel right are the ones that are getting a lot more views now. Yeah, I, I can kind of understand that because the beards article 
is just like you say a perfect it just b beautifully showcases how controlling the religion is and how the the teachings are formed more through opinions through individuals having opinions than necessarily through through scripture so that doesn't surprise me frankly and i just wanted to add that while i was researching for my book I was constantly on, on JW Facts. Um, I, I can remember specifically when I was researching for 1925, it's just useful to have all of the quotes kind of nicely lined up for you so that you can see what the most damning material was. So, so thank you so much for making that information easily available. It's brilliant. Good. So uh, I'm down to my last two questions. Um, just before... <laughs> Just before we went on air, um, a friend of yours was was on Skype, and we were kind of <laughs> we were talking about. She was talking about the impact that um, our activism has had on her. Um, is it surreal for you to think about the people whose lives have been impacted by your website? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't feel any different than anyone else. I don't feel like. Special, like even at work, I've never been a manager or anything because I just don't feel I have the, you know, I don't want to be telling people what to do. And so that, that yeah, that, that I sort of have got this um, this celebrity status, I guess, within that community. And so many people, like from all over the world, everywhere I go, people want to meet me, take me for a beer or whatever, uh, you know, come and chat. It's, uh, I'm sort of astounded. My, my wife, uh, or ex wife now, I guess, uh, we we went to um, California, uh, Los Angeles, and we got meeting by some people, and then they organised a big dinner, and there's a whole lot of people there. And my wife's just like, "Wow, like you're just nobody, you're just like, just a guy. Like, what is with this?" And so I, I find it uh, unbelievable. Like, I don't I don't think um, it's deserving. I don't really think I've done any more than than anyone else. And I, and I don't actually even know as much about certain topics. Like, people want to talk to me about topics, and my my site is about everything and so there's people that really specialize in the tetragrammaton or really specialize in different words and um and, and different doctrine and, and things that well, know way more than me so i feel like always a little bit uh, embarrassed when i talk to people and i realize they, they know more about something than i do but i think um i think it's just that i managed to get it all into this one cohesive package and, and and again, back to like when I started writing it, my my uh, mother and some different people were reading it. Were going, there's a lot of, sort of anger here, and this isn't totally true. And I realised I just had to get rid of all that emotion, all that all of the any errors. I copied stuff from other other sources online where they hadn't quoted properly, and I realised any the smallest error undermines the whole thing. And so it was really more, I guess, it's just that that whole background to where I got to where I was that I just managed to get information. That was like I needed to keep it just accurate, as accurate as possible. So yeah, I don't feel deserving of any of, of, of anything, but um, I'm a bit overwhelmed by you know, so many people um, whose lives have been changed. Yeah, I, I see. I know ex I can totally relate to what you're saying about celebrity. I, I don't feel remotely like a celebrity when people ban that uh, word around. It's like, well, a celebrity is someone who can't go shopping without being approached, <laughs> and I can very easily go shopping without being approached. But at, at the same time, you have this this niche movement where um, where things need to be said, and if you are lucky enough to to hit the right uh, to get the right message across and and hit the right audience, suddenly lots of people know you. Um, so it, it it's no surprise that people feel feel affection and, and admiration um, but at the same time I, I go back to your friend who was on camera just before we went live and she was saying that she was affected by the worst convention ever series that I did and as a mm. result of that her child won't be raised as a Jehovah's Witness uh, for which she was very very grateful but I was saying, well, listen, I woke up because of Paul. So <laughs> it's it's just incredible to think that, that there is that potential for lives to be changed for the better purely through putting information across, and, and that never ceases to amaze me. Yeah, I, I did. I really thought that when I was at the meeting today where I, there's a bunch of families with little children. I'm like, a lot of... The witnesses that I met, they all seemed really, really, you know, lovely, and um, and some of them seemed to be really happy there. But I just knew, like, looked at those kids and shuddered to think about what I went through, what they're going to go through with this, 
alienation at school and this uh, all the insecurity that brings up and the embarrassment and you know the missing out and and so it's those ones that that like you say the that next generation that you save like the ones that are leaving now that you know they're going to go through so much suffering leaving the religion but they will stop that next generation um so yeah i think uh, that that's the important thing and i've got a graph on my website about if the witnesses continue growing at like six and a half seven percent like they were in the 90s they'd be up at uh, I think it was like 14 million or something now instead of 8 million but because in the last 20 years they went from 8% to sort of 2% that's like 6 million less people that are witnesses so it's not the it's not the ones that are in there it's the ones that aren't in there that don't even know that they've been saved or protected from that damage they're the ones that um that are they have really having the benefit from it yeah and that that's kind of what gives me the biggest thrill is the thought of helping people who will never even know that they've been helped <laughs> because it's their parent or their grandparent even that that decided to make the switch so uh, it's very very uh, satisfying isn't it to see that um final question um i asked this to all of my guests um we've mentioned your youtube channel but i i and maybe this would be the good time to mention it again but do you have anything to plug <laughs> Well, I, uh, this will give me some uh, motivation, I guess, to make some more videos. But yeah, I, I have this uh, the JW Facts uh, video. So I've got a I've got a new article coming out hopefully over the next week on um, just the statistics, a uh, rundown of all the different statistics on growth. And then I've got a really cute one coming with my uh, my son, where he's like absolutely adorable little kid, and so he's reading all the nasty emails that people send me and I'm reading all the nice ones, which I'm not sure that was really not kind of me to do, but he, uh, he thinks it's a bit, uh, he's pretty blown away by how some of the sort of information people can send me. So that will be cute, but that might be uh, next month, I guess I'll get that out. Oh, brilliant. Well, you know, again, viewers, if you haven't yet subscribed to Paul's channel, I think it's safe to say, Paul, that you, you did some videos a while back, maybe two or three years ago, and then you went quiet on YouTube. But from mm -hmm. what you're telling us, you're now, you know, you're now going to make more of an effort with it. So, if you haven't yet subscribed to Paul's channel, the channel is JW Facts. Quite simply, um, go on there, click subscribe, and you know, be treated to the videos that that Paul has just mentioned and more. But Paul, it's been an absolute honour to have you on the channel. As I was saying to you before we went on air, I hope it's not long before I get to shake your hand in person. Um, but thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. It's a total pleasure. And yeah, you definitely have to get down under here. Uh, the, there's a lot of people waiting to meet you. I can't wait. I, I have relatives in Australia, so I have lots of reasons to go. But it's it's just the airfare at the moment. But I'll I'll figure it out. But again, thanks so much. And viewers, I hope you have found this conversation as interesting as I have. Please don't forget to subscribe for more videos. And as always, thank you for watching. <laughs>